We have also youth bearing their muscles to join Defence Forces. Young men wait to be checked for their wellness during the Kenya Defence Forces recruitment drive at Mwiga Stadium in Nyeri yesterday, where a man was arrested for presenting a forged examination certificate. The countrywide recruitment continues today. And of course, also another development is, and many people normally ask about this, maybe I have my expert here, they will tell me today why they normally turn away young men who have, uh, you know, they don't have uh, or the dent dental formula is compromised. Maybe they've yellowed and I, we normally wonder why. Maybe I need to throw this to Captain Werunga to tell us what is the rhyme and reason for me not to actually be in the army if my teeth or my dental, my dental formula is not up to scratch. I know he left the other day. So he who? who? <laughs> <laughs> Captain Onderi, <laughs> <laughs> tell me. Yes. What, what has my teeth got to do anything with my gun or me banging the... I think the uh, it, it is a very basic, um, it's a very basic answer. If somebody has a toothache, uh, if we, some, one of us had a toothache here, mm -hmm. that is actually more important to that person than the suffering of others. Oh, that's really? a fact. Yes. So, um, <laughs> the, unfortunately, you know there is a lot of preoccupation on the, the mm. checking of the dental formula. <laughs> Whereas uh, the entire medical examination, mm. Captain Verunga will tell you, is so thorough yeah. that it checks other, even other areas we do not want to mention on, on a morning show, <laughs> which is being watched all over. <laughs> but uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, if you've seen people, once you cross uh, the equator towards the Siolo, yes. much of the food that is eaten there is dry ration. In fact, you're eating the dry biscuits. And I can assure you, Dibal, if you had uh, broken teeth, you may not want to have, uh, you, uh, you do not want um, an encounter of your mouth with dry ration. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, uh, it's not something I think the idea is just that because of survivability yes. and they are going to operate in very difficult terrain, you need to be able to survive on anything, even on snakes, on twigs. Yeah. So they want you to be a complete human being who can So you can actually su survive on snakes? Uh, yes. 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 That, By the that's way, part you, of a menu. Oh, yes. You are one. Uh, you are told you can survive on ABCD when you don't have the normal ration. And I'm happy in there is here. Yeah. So we, we are given the list. Yes. So, yeah. So if you go out and you are told the food, you cannot be rescued. These are the things you can feed on. And therefore, I think the essence is that they just want a complete human being. And teeth is one of them because you can only survive by eating. And, and therefore it forms birthmark? part. A hmm? birthmark. Yeah, what about no, birth 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 up, up this side is not a problem, but on the legs down here is because of the patties and the socks. Yes. You are supposed <laughs> to tie your leg in such a manner the snake cannot bite you. There are things we use, oh, really? and if you have something that slips, then you are not uh, safe. But a bath mark that is not serious upper side of the body is not a serious issue. And my height? Because you need to be seeing far. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I think um, I think the bar for, uh, for KDF for KDF for KDF the height the height uh, is not a very major. But there is not an issue. Uh -huh. Yeah, the height is not a very major issue. In fact, mm. they do recruit people as low as five two. Yeah, yeah, for KDF. However, for the National Police Service, yes. uh, and I think Mr. Mali will confirm <laughs> that you basically policing people. And you need to have a certain uh, ability to see far. If, but in, in KDF, height per se is not, uh, is not a very major issue. In fact, uh, to them is that agility, the ability to survive in the most hostile environment. But there is a reason why we, we're talking about this. Out of our 41 million population, 12 million are uh, fit for military service. 12 so, million are fit. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that is why we have the numbers. But we should also be asking this question. Yes. Yesterday in Kisumu County, in one of the districts in Kisumu County, mm -hmm. only three people are recruited because people did not turn up. In fact, that, is, that, that to me is a very great concern. Mm. Yes. That um, the lady who was taken said she was very happy. I, I've been following. Mm. And then they said, the recruiting officer said, he was worried he wanted 10 people and could only get three mm -hmm. and so i am calling upon the youth of kenya not to fear military service <laughs> but uh, i think on, it's on a good rest, thing yeah. and it is a it is a it is prestigious and honorable to serve mm -hmm. your country uh -huh. yes and then i think on a very serious note the issue of height also is very important because a soldier is supposed to carry a maximum of 40 kilos 40 kilos on your back so height also balances your uh, uh, skeleton yeah what do you call it 
the your vertebrae. Yeah, vertebrae. So it is very important because I also look at what you need to carry when you're walking, and it's a maximum of 40 kilos. So sometimes if you are very short, then it becomes a problem. But I thought if you're, you're short, you're more stable as well. Yeah, yeah. that is why, yeah. That yeah. Is, that's why they go up to 5'2". <laughs> that, that is why KDF you know, goes up. Yeah, that's why they so go up to 5'2". Really yes. so yeah. I'm, I'm heavy, you know, <laughs> I can't really topple, topple yeah. over with that, you know, yeah. uh, yes. a, a lot of weight being saddled on my back. Mm -hmm. But another question that, of course, and we want also to focus, as we, much as we are actually looking for police officers, there's also a very critical uh, situation that is happening, and this has been captured also in the standard. If you may just pick up that particular page, where they're saying a lot of... Uh, there's a concern of a huge number of police officers assigned to VIPs. Right now we know, because I think we can hack back to maybe two years back, where we saw almost 10,000 police officers, they've been assigned to VIPs in this country. And right now we've not even hit that particular mark where uh, it's being required by the United Nations that uh, one to uh, f the, the population of 450, one to 450, it should be one police officer overseeing 450. Right now we are at one to 350. Is that so? No, so we've, that, we've not, and that's, not, that's the have. international we, standard. We, have. we, have. we haven't. In we fact, have. we are go we have gone beyond. The, that's why we are one to 350. One to 350. Yes. We've gone Instead, beyond. Yes, it's not we, one we are, to 450. One to 450 <laughs> means that it's a standard. It's a standard. But we are one to 350. So we are doing very well. No, We're I doing very we, well. We, yes. We need to be clear here. Yes. The number of police officers. But we, uh, since, the average, no, but just even yes. before we go there, mm. until when did we reach to that one to 350? That's what I'm trying to say. Fantastic. Because, you tell us then. Yeah, the issue here is uh, the last number I knew, and I've been close to the police. It was 80,000 police officers. Now, the population is, as we speak today, 47.5 million. So we've not hit 350. The latest figure I got from some sort of economists, yes. uh, you know, these are graduated figures from the last census. They are talking of Kenya hitting 47.5, as we speak. The last number I knew, and I know they've been recruiting 10,000, 10,000, was 80,000. Now, that one is also supposed to be affected by attrition. Mm -hmm. And attrition is in many ways, death, resi resignation, retirement. So I don't think we've hit uh, 358, but yes, we are heading there. We are heading to around seven something. That's the last figure I knew, but you can do the calculations. Right. But now on the issue of VIP, <coughs> the last time we were, I was allowed to be near uh, corridors of power. I knew there was a document being done, and I think it was approved by the then IG, Mr. Kimayo, that is stipulated very clearly how VIPs are going to be given. VIP of, I mean, officers are going to be distributed to guard our VIPs. And that document was very clear. It was speaking very clearly on the levels of your VVIP, VIP, and, and, and downwards. And therefore, if the country used that policy document that is stipulated how officers are supposed to be distributed, we'll not be talking of this number of about 7,000 police officers being given duties that are not core to what they trained about. So as, as we come back to the same issue, this country never follows regulations, it never follows rules, but at the end of the day, I know there's a document that was approved by the then Inspector General because he's the one who is in charge of the distribution of uh, officers to VIPs. And it was very clear, the bell, and you could see an MP was supposed to have two only. I remember the figures. An MP was supposed to have two, the Chief Justice was supposed to have five. So it was very clear, the, the, the Speaker of the National Assembly, in accordance with the responsibility and role of that person in this country. But you see, that has never been followed. That's why we still have a number of about 7,000 police officers being given to duties that are not core to what we have. Right. Yeah. Duties are not core to what we have. But let, let's see just the numbers before we come to you, Professor Naomi Damba. Uh, the dis distribution of police officers in Kenya. We have 1,009 officers. Uh, this is Kenya's police force uh, is estimated to have. Or 9,000 in the general service unit. We have 13,000 uh, in directorate of uh, criminal investigation. Uh, investigations. We have 2,000 in anti-stock theft unit and more than 4,000 mostly from administration police guard vital installations and 4,000 uh, 4,000 assist traffic movement across the country. So how, how many so far do we have deployed to, you know, watch over our 90 patrolling? Let, let, let's hear from 
uh, George Musaman, before Imagine I come to you. We have a problem with the police deployment. And as Captain has said, there was that policy document that was uh, approved by Kimayo. And it clearly stated how many police officers are supposed to be deployed to uh, protect VIPs. But it has not been implemented. And in addition to that, as much as we are talking about the number of police guarding VIPs, we also have a very big number of police officers guarding private businesses. And that is why we are not seeing police on the streets. Uh -huh. That is why we are having prison wardens patrolling the streets of Nairobi. Yet we are talking about having achieved the UN ratio. Yes. Where are these police officers? Wrong deployment. We've commercialized the police. And I think the problem is with the police managers. How do we deploy these people? How do you have a police officer guarding the Nairobi sports, uh, sports uh, center? What significance does it, does it have with providing services to members of the public? It doesn't. I think this commercialization of the police is the big problem. Where are these policemen? We don't see them patrolling the streets, most of them. And in fact, if you go to countries like uh, the UK, mm -hmm. you'll find that most police officers are uniformed. They patrol the streets in uniform to deter crime. But here you'll find that for other reasons, most of the police officers we have in the streets are in civilian clothes. That does not argue well for us as a country. But and, maybe, and, uh, and I believe this is, if uh, we should not only be talking about the, this deployment to protect VIPs, let us also look at that aspect of going to Daivasha, flower farms, you find APs there, posted. Where is that revenue that is being generated from that deployment mm -hmm. going to? Because it's definitely not ending up in the government pockets. So I think this issue of policing in this country, we should ask the managers to account because we are not getting services. We have the numbers we've talked about achieving the ratio. Right. We've seen vehicles okay. being given to the police, but has it translated to good services to the members of the public? Fantastic. It yeah, is a good point. We have, uh, we have achieved the ratio, or maybe we are near there. I don't believe we still have achieved that particular ratio. But the question is, even as we've achieved this ratio, it was, you know, cutting it very close. This was just in the recent past, I think in the last one year, yes. that we've achieved this. And we have these police officers who are, we will be recruited here. They'll go to the training. Then they'll be deployed, like what happened in Baragoy, who are very incompetent. And it's so many of them will be slain, right? So when you're talking about de deployment, and yes, we have now maybe reached that particular ratio. What about the, the experience that comes with it? Because it seems, yes, we have a blotted or maybe the given number we have achieved. But when it comes to experientially, you know, doing your work, that is a different kettle of fish. Debal, training and doctrine is the very basis of any fighting force or any defense and security force. Now, we've talked of people deployed to do what are called non-core duties, especially for the police service. Yes. Now, I want you to look at how the Kenya Defense Forces does it. The Kenya Defense Forces do not use the core fighting force or the units for fighting to guard installations. That is done by the Kenya Defense Forces Constabulary. And those are either people who have served and retired and then recalled yes. to do those auxiliary duties mm -hmm. because those are not the core duties. Yes. Now, in Kenya, we have argued consistently for some of us that we need to have an auxiliary security force. Yes. And what is an auxiliary security force? This is a force that, does, that is trained in the police colleges trained in the police colleges, properly en enumerated by government and recorded and registered, and they can be arms, then we can deploy them to guard malls, we can deploy them to guard those flower farms, we can deploy them to private security farms. That is why we were having a bill on private security farms. That is what happens in developed countries, that these people may not be per se, Mm -hmm. working for the police service, but they are trained, registered, enumerated, and consistently um, checked for what is called currency. What we say currency is that they go for the rage to test their ability to use firearms, their ability to understand the law and apply it properly and not to harm citizens, but those are the ones who guard VIPs. So that then we can have the uniformed police officers, as George is saying, concentrate on their commodities. Nobody and nobody in the Kenya Defense Forces is going to be deployed to guard the perimeter fence. That is the work of the constabulary. And the constabulary has a separate command. It is simply auxiliary okay. to the main force. All right.
Maybe as we're wrapping up on this, uh, because we don't need to belabor this point, it was just a headlining thought. Uh, right now we have around 18,000 presidential candidates, candidates who are running for presidency. And uh, the question is, it is required, they say by law, that all these uh, candidates, they should be assigned police officers to protect them. So if I declare myself a presidential candidate today, uh, do I really pass master? to actually get security, because that is also a national threat. Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if the Electoral Commission uh, declares you a presidential candidate, you are immediately given security. Because the problem is, if, if you die within that campaign period, the elections are suspended. So you can see how important these uh, upcoming presidential candidates are. They are very important. Otherwise, we can suspend the elections. Coming back to these uh, VIP police officers, you know it's a privilege. It's a privilege to go and protect a VIP. Because these uh, police officers, corporals, inspectors, they would like that because first there is a salary rise. They get a lot of salary rise out of it. Then their work is to sit in the Mercedes. <laughs> they sit comfortably in that very good vehicle. They go to inter Intercontinental, they go to Serena, they go to Rift Valley, in Naivasha, so the, their life is good. Yes. Sometimes they fly to Mombasa uh, by Kenya Airways, which is exten expensive instead of going jabo jet. So these guys are actually, actually want very much to be within parliament buildings, within the you know, Harambe House. You know, this is good to be a VIP protector Thank because you. of the... And then the others, the others, the other, the reason why you don't see a policeman uh, protecting us or, you know, looking after crimes, the, most of them are in traffic. It's a privilege to be in the traffic police. It's also a privilege to be in central bank. You know, so a lot of these uh, police officers, ordinary police officers, want to move out All and right. go to protect. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, let, let's just uh, get done with, uh, with the dailies. Midama, we'll come to you. This is uh, the standard Joho Names new running mate. Uh, you can follow that. And also, the star has uh, this particular headlining story, State House picked Sonko running mate. It says Vivo Energy, MD Poly Kapigathe, unveiled as the corporate face behind the candidate president's aide, Jomo Isaga, and solicitor, solicitor general, General G. Muturi interviewed prospective candidates, and this story is on page four and five of the start today. So we can see uh, this was the doing of uh, State House, right? So Sonko did not really have uh, uh, much room to swing his cart as far as uh, choosing the running mate is concerned. We don't want to go there, please, because I know we'll be <laughs> opening another Pandora's box. <laughs> yeah. So let's see what we have on the fourth page also of a business daily today. Maize dealers windfall in six billion shillings subsidy plan. This is what we have in the business daily. And let me, let me show you also what we have on the front page of the East African this week. Kenya gets ready to export oil this month, trucks and tanks. In final lap, three firms are awarded contracts to provide specialized tank containers and transport the crude to Mombasa. And in Rwanda, we have the New Times for you. I just want to show you what we have on the front page. Genocide Rwandan faces extradition from Denmark. This is what we have as the headlining story. And we have also the editorial cartoons. NASA is a crybaby there by way or no elections and you can see the baby is throwing away all the ballot boxes boxes every which way and you have also the pacifier there so the loud cries are coming out we have also the people daily with that particular head uh, editorial cartoon mom why are the soldiers outside cyber cafes to prevent cyber attacks so we're talking about police officers and private firms this also comes up to as you can see right now. But also, there's a big threat as far as cybersecurity is concerned with the ransomware uh, virus that is attack attacking mostly the Windows, the Windows software. Also, in the Daily Nation today, this is what has been captured by Monene. Our ties stand on a concrete, concrete foundation. And you can see where our ties are. This is debt that Kenyans are being saddled with. And you can see Wenjiko there. She's very tired right now. You know, uh, sweat or sweat breaking out from her, breaking sweat, I should say, and carrying a baby uh, there. So this is 
what is happening. The baby, of course, uh, depicting the future of our children who will be saddled with all these debt. And I wanted to show you, I don't know why it's, it, keeps, it keep, keeps on escaping. This is what we have also in the standard as far as Kado is concerned in today's in today's standard. A big one, Trump in Saudi Arabia. And of course, Al-Bashir will be going to Saudi Arabia as well for the Riyadh summit, which will be happening on Sunday. We'll give you all the details much, much later in the course of the program. But for now, we want to go back to our discussion as we're winding up on the topic of food security. So we are actually in this mire right now, and we tend to see this as a band-aid solution, you know, just exporting to give them uh, to the retailers and then maybe store some uh, at the strategic grain reserves. Should we critically look at this particular situation? I'd ask you a question before. We have water table in this country that can sustain this country for 70 good years. What is the way forward with such, you know, an expanse of water table in the country, in Turukana and another one in Rai? Professor Noam Midamba. The bar, uh, Israel pump, Israel is a long strip of a country, uh, but the pump water from Galilee and supply the whole country. And they have the, one of the largest desalination plant in the world uh, that supply the, the entire country. They recycle every bit of water. There are three type of pipes. Uh, one is a drinkable straight. You don't have to uh, go and get uh, drink water. Uh, the other one is for uh, irrigation, uh, what we call drip irrigation. And the other one used for, for other things. Now, we need to be serious uh, looking at the future of this country. Because right now, so much rain, and it was not too long ago, when we were buying waters in Nairobi. In fact, in my university, I decided to sink borehole because I cannot wait for uh, all this. Uh, I understand they close the pipe sometime and then start selling water all over the place. We need to seriously think about the use of Lake Victoria. I mean, there's been uh, talk about the, you know, the, with all the great lake countries talking about the use of Lake Victoria, the Turkana water, and all other water resources we have in the country. We need to use them very efficiently. We need to look at county by county, mm -hmm. what can grow in those countries, and how can we manage the growth in such a way that the, the growth and distribution of, uh, of, of, of those things. Um, uh, Captain Wanderi and I were just talking a few minutes ago. We grow some of the sweetest potatoes in the country. You know, in fact, high demand in England. But if you walk uh, or drive along the roads where they grow potatoes, uh, you know, mothers are sitting with a bag full of potato, which you can buy for nothing, and then the rest are rotten. We're not thinking about drying those potatoes so we can use them at this, uh, this time when, when we, we lack. We're not thinking about storage. We're not thinking about distribution. Where, is, where, where are people Thank you. who are supposed to be strategic right. thinking? Thank you. Let's say, uh, give our headline thoughts on that as well, Captain Wanderi. Yeah. Uh, Nibal, a third of all the food produced in the world goes to waste because of poor storage. And this is the debate we should be getting into. That are we storing each and every grain that we are producing in this country? On irrigation schemes, we would not even to emphasize, even before we go to the aquifer in Trukana, that should be our strategic reserve in terms of water. Mm -hmm. That is the reserve we should keep strategically just in case anything happens. But right now, we have River Yala, we have in Western Kenya, we have River Tana in, in Mount Kenya, we have uh, River Wasonyiro, we have Adi River. The waters are flowing overland, flooding the lower parts of Kenya. Nobody is thinking about irrigation. We have depended on rain-fed agriculture from independence because of 
the revision or the revisionist attitude of the people who drafted the session of paper number 60 uh, number 10 of 1965 mm -hmm. because to them the marginal areas of Kenya are not, were not important we are paying a heavy cost for that it is the 23 asal counties in this country that now have enough lad which can be converted into the farmlands that Captain Werunga was talking about for what is called extensive, uh, extensive irrigation. It is not the high potential areas, the 24. Mm -hmm. Those ones, the population is such that you cannot even talk about commercial farming. In fact, we should be concentrating our efforts, not on the aquifer in Trukana, but damming the waters, the headwaters of the major rivers in this country. And building water pans all over. In, it is very sad that I was in Aboseli the other day. It was very dry in the lower sections. Yes. But right now it is flooding. It's inaccessible. But nobody is thinking of doing an overla dam yeah, to well, get that water. Mm -hmm. And then to safeguard the livestock for the pastoralists as well as water for the agriculturists. What we have in this country, as I said before, is two good papers, very nice written <coughs> things, but very few people who can stand up for the country and implement those things, however painful it will be. Mm -hmm. All right. And of course, uh, we, we understand when it comes to planning, uh, we were here before also when we had milk glut, right? And we saw uh, that we had poor storage. We didn't have enough coolants or coolers to actually store uh, the, the milk. And we saw farmers wading through milk. I don't, uh, I think you can remember when you saw those pictures and they're really, really, really uh, disturbing because how can we uh, as a country get to that particular, you know, uh, that particular mark where we're food secure when we see milk, farmers wading through with their gambots through milk and, you know, it just going mm. down the tubes. Mm. And right now we don't have milk in the country. So poor planning, critical issue is, is it about the leadership? that we are facing a crisis right now? Dr. Apollos, I, very briefly. You know, when I, uh, when I think about some of these things, sometimes I talk to myself. Like, when I'm in London, I go to Victoria Street, I go underground to go to Cardiff very fast. So the, I'm, imagining, subway, yes. yeah, I'm imagining now, one of these days I went uh, uh, some of these trains and go to Kisumu very fast. But to go to Kisumu to do what? Uh, uh, when I saw the 13 locomotives arriving in Kenya, I was wondering, for who are they arriving? Because most of us are supposed to be in the rural areas. Because someone said yesterday, I think on AM Live, about this money that is coming to buy the Naivasha Kisumu. And the way it can uh, irrigate Trukana, Kainuk, and the whole of that area. If Oalulo, if these open spaces can be made productive, the rural urban migration would stop. So the kind of crimes and juvenile delinquency I find in Kibra, in Mathare, in Kagem, everywhere, the unemployment that I see, the poverty in the slums would cease because everybody would be very busy in Kainuk, in Takwell Gorge, everywhere in Longewa, and someone said Amaya. I don't know how Captain Amaya, you know Amaya because Amaya is a very good place, but because of the exploitation of poverty is a very bad place right now. So for me, I would actually want, if we can expand our rural areas and open up, it would be a better idea than having some of this very fast rain. We are not a fast rain country yet. We are still out in the rural areas where our people would be instead of them coming to urban areas. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I think ours is a leadership problem. It's not that we don't know what to do. We have very many examples. Look at the Galana irrigation uh, project. What happened to it? Let's go to Takwell. That one was also supposed to be an irrigation project and the purpose of that was to deal with also, it, it was also supposed to give a security solution yes. to the banditry menace in, uh, in Trukana and West Pokot. Along the line, it died. Uh, we, do the th we start doing things, the right things, but at the end of the day, I don't know what happens. For example, we had uh, this Makweni water project. All the way from Kilimanjaro, it was supposed to end up in Makweni. But somebody somewhere diverted that water. Instead of it going to Makweni, he diverted the water to a river, to a flower farm. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to question is, do we have leaders that have a vision for this country? 
do we have leaders that understand the needs of this country? Right. Do we have our priorities uh -huh. right or do we have them upside down? I think this is where we need to ask ourselves. I think we are in a leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. We have people that are up there, but they don't know what to do for this country. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's hear finally from uh, Wirunga Simiu and then we'll take our, 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 one or two tweets from our viewers and calls as well. Yes, I, I think um, I'll say this. Uh, this country has what we call embedded impunity. You see, when you have embedded impunity, uh, you can give me a job today, I'll steal, and then I'll go home. And if I know that nobody is going to ask me questions uh, because I can talk nicely, then things will be what we are seeing today. Let me tell you about the water issue. Uh, professor mentioned about uh, Lake Victoria. You know, one of our biggest problems in this country, and people never talk about it, is that we have problems with our borders, international borders. Mm -hmm. We have issues in Lake Victoria. We are now having issues in Lake Turkana, Professor. We are having weak issues in uh, Indian Ocean. So let's, let's forget about the border <laughs> uh, water systems. But like what uh, Captain Wandera said, if, if, and that's why I'm using the word if, if this country wants to get sustainable livelihood projects, then we must hold people to account. And there are people and systems in this country that are well established, people employed to manage those systems that are not doing their work. So for as long as impunity reigns, as long as people know you can give me a job and I cannot, I'll not deliver and I'll still get paid and go home, I don't think we are moving anywhere. And the best example is Galana. We don't know what happened. I have no idea. I read in the papers. But the, the, the initial implication of Galana Kulalo was so impressive that we knew that for once we are going to have a project on food security that is going to sustain this country. Three years down the line, issues, problems, uh, corruption issues, and um, I, I don't know what is happening. So at the end of the day, I think this is what I want to conclude. If we don't reign in impunity, if we don't allow people, if we don't hold people to account, we can have as many documents as we can. We can have as many ideas as we can. But until that day when we shall hold you to account for a position you've been given to deliver services to this country, we shall not go anywhere. Thank you. And we want to also get your views as well, what you're saying on Twitter already. You can see some of them are squeezed on your screen and Usha also she's standing by to tell us what is happening also on Facebook as well. Usha? Right, 15 minutes to the top of the hour and your comments are flowing in. Remember, hashtag AMLiveNTV is how you can chime into the conversation. Um, on our question of the day, we asked, do we have a leadership crisis in Kenya? And um, we have Stephanie Stephen, sorry, who says, yes, we do. They may act like they have it all together, but the middle class and the poor can see right through the scam from food security, national security, health. The list is so long, we need a drastic change. We also have Paul Gayo who asks, if they can bring the Unger price down into half price, why not tenant rents? Um, moving on to Twitter, we have... Samuel, who says, uh, the discussion of import of maize is a temporary question. Let us discuss and find solutions on a long-lasting solution of maize locally. There's a lot more feedback. Um, hashtag game live TV is how you can chime in. Back to you, Dibal. Many thanks indeed, uh, Usha. I think uh, there is a technical challenge there with uh, our mics a bit. We'll rectify that. But a lot of, of tweets we can see. And uh, also we have, uh, uh, we know, Paul saying that we've been having struggling economy since 1978. And this is a clear indication that our leaders ain't doing enough. Also, we have Kim Kimsky saying, loving the show this morning, nodding my head in total concurrency. The learned gentleman, and then he continues, we'll go we'll through the rest of that. Also, we have uh, Samuel Orutua. In Nairobi, you can drive in the, in the hall of Nairobi after 10 p.m. without seeing a police officer. Then criminals can do their business. business. This is what he's saying. Also, we have Nainjo saying, kudos, my criminology lecturer at Edgerton, <laughs> Dr. Apollos, for candidly giving your views on police uh, ratio. 
to Kenyan's citizens, right? Then uh, you need to tell your student to actually correctly spell candidly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the criminology spelling for the word candid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> uh, strategic interest the U.S. have in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia does hold the leverage in terms of in terms of this. Saudi Arabia is afraid of the of, of Sudan, and if Saudi Arabia thinks that they can create a rapprochement between the United States and Sudan, uh, then it will be working for their uh, regional and strategic interests. Mm -hmm. Remember, Saudi Arabia is currently embroiled in conflict in Yemen uh, against um, forces supported by Iran. Saudi Arabia again is also involved in the conflict in Syria. So Saudi Arabia would want to draw as many allies as possible. If you, if you note carefully, my Sudan is mainly a Sunni Muslim country, mm -hmm. majority. Yes. And Saudi, Saudi Arabia has a lot of interest in countries where there is Sunni majority. And therefore, they would want a situation. And you know now, America, the United States is also on the same side as Saudi Arabia in the conflict in Syria, mm -hmm. as well as Yemen. So uh, then Sudan would be an ally in the event that, uh, again, it's, it's in the Mediterranean. And, and you can see the geopolitical interests mm -hmm. of both countries in that region. So it, 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 it might be uh, that Saudi Arabia wants to extend its diplomatic prowess uh, in the region, uh, in the Middle East, as well as uh, use its strategic uh, advantage in the region and its relations with, um, with the United States to create more allies for itself because it is embroiled in conflict in other places. All right, we, we can also uh, forget the executive order from Donald Trump as well. And was it Sudan or South Sudan that was on that list? It is Sudan. It is Sudan itself was yes. on that list. Yes. So yes. You, we, if we find Bashir and Trump now sitting on the same table uh, in light of that particular executive order, so what do we make out of it? But uh, these two guys are funny guys because Trump himself and uh, Bashir are not signatories to the Rome Statutes. So yes. they have no respect to international law. So even as they go to Saudi Arabia, they, go, they can go and wind there because Saudi Arabia also has no respect with international law. So Trump and America generally, and I hate America because of its double speak. Most of the time they say they respect international law. Let these guys do not ratify or see to some of these international laws, including Geneva Conventions. So even as they meet in wherever they will meet in Saudi Arabia, Trump, Bashir, the king, and even this boy from North Korea, if they can all meet together, even in Cuba, they have no respect with the, our international criminal court. So they can meet and do whatever they want, but Trump should not keep on telling us to be taken to the Hague because you can't take his people. You cannot arrest an American soldier for any Geneva Conventions All right. violations. All right, let's so, hear from George, very briefly on this. I think uh, what is happening is that uh, both America and Saudi Arabia are looking at their strategic interests. They're not looking at what is going to happen after. And as uh, Dr. Apollo has said, both are not uh, signatories to the to the to, to the ICC statue. Yes. So they don't see any harm in them meeting Al Bashir. Yet Al Bashir is accused of uh, com having committed genocide in Africa. So it, we are looking at a situation whereby we should ask ourselves: Do these countries care about what is happening in Africa? Do they care about the genocide that happened in Darfur, for example? Do they even care what is happening in Southern Sudan? Because I know if there's any interest they have in Southern Sudan, then they'll very quickly meet uh, Salva Kiir. So I think this is a situation whereby we need to look at what is happening and then come up with solutions that will fit us. Instead of looking at America for solutions to our problems, you not look to Saudi Arabia for solutions to our problems because they will move on, life is moving on to, to, for them. Mm -hmm. uh, what they need is to serve the interests of their people. I think this is what we are seeing here. Thank you. Captain Urunga, very briefly. I, I think, um, and I want Professor to speak more to this. This is an area of international politics, and um, my take is, is, is simple. Uh, Sudan, for some time, was fairly dependent on Iran, and there was this feeling that Iran was trying to extend its influence beyond the real Middle East. So along the way, I think Sudan was convinced to start turning its back on Iran, and therefore this started becoming very close to Saudi Arabia. 
Number two, we need to look at this issue in terms of the Shia and the Sunni conflicts in the Middle East. Uh, Sudan is like now the head of the Sunni anti-Shia systems in the Middle East, I mean in Saudi Arabia. And therefore, Sudan, uh, being a Sunni-dominated country, it is, I think they are now creating their own axis because we have an axis of Iran, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Syria, which is fairly Shia-dominated. My take is that I think they are trying to create a, a Sunni axis mm -hmm. of Saudi Arabia, which is a very powerful uh, country. Saudi, Sudan is a very powerful country in terms of military. And therefore, to the Americans, what gives us leverage, we are good to go. And, and therefore, they are looking at uh, embedding themselves in a Sunni-dominated country in Africa, apart from Egypt, which is also a very close ally, and therefore, if you can have Egypt and Sudan and Saudi Arabia with very powerful militaries that can counter what Iran and Hezbollah and Syria and the Russians are trying to create in the Middle East, I think it's just about international politics. And therefore, before this president goes to Saudi Arabia, they are normally given lists. And Professor, you can bear with me. So even when he's going there, he already knows who he's going to meet, what he's expected to talk. And to me, it is just about international politics, the realignment in terms of Shia and Sunni, uh, Arab Muslim groupings, and therefore creating very powerful allies to deter what they think is Iran and Russia trying to do in the Middle East. And therefore, if you have a strong military country like Sudan, you have Saudi Arabia, and then you have your small Israel, but very powerful. Therefore, you create some axis. And we also, we are told, when you read military uh, uh, intelligence reports, that actually Saudi Arabia and Israel, they are trying to create a rapport. And that is supposed to become very open so that they start working together. So to me, it's just about realignment of, uh, of interest in the Middle East and ensuring that you have countries that can stand on their own and therefore, if the U.S. wants to counter the influence of Russia in the Middle East, then you have Muslim countries yes. that can stand on their own. So, Trump, project, uh, uh, st very strategically, as we we're winding up to give also your headline thoughts, is trying also to make sure that uh, we have also Israel being roped in right now because it's deployed also uh, a new ambassador, yeah. David uh, Friedman, to, to Israel right now, and he'll be going to Jerusalem very, very, very very soon and we know also there has been that debate of whether we should have uh, the embassy in Jerusalem or not yeah. and I think now that that is a, is a foregone conclusion as we speak very briefly Professor Tommy Damba uh, I think Captain Warunga uh, very nice analysis of um, potentially what the outcome is uh, for in this situation uh, however there is a really unpredictable um, uh, person in the middle of this uh, by the name of Trump. Um, we, we are not sure what he's going to do from one thing to another. Uh, it was yesterday, he took a top secret um, information uh, provided to him about ISIS and he gave it to, um, uh, he gave it to the, the Russians. To Russians. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, of course the top military analyst and their strategic people wondering what in the world is this. You know, all in all, there is international norm. And international norm uh, with the moral leadership, values and everything has existed since Second World War. And all American leaders have followed that without any exception. And therefore, someone like Abbasir, who has killed so many people, maimed so many people, displaced so many people, who has not stepped at the head for him to meet with Trump, that will blow up the whole thing about morality and everything else and leave the world uh, to unknown destiny. Thank, thank you. 30 seconds, uh, Captain Onderi, as a winding up. Yeah, I, I think, um, Dibal, let me use this opportunity to say that um, we need to relook at global security in light of what has happened uh, in the cyber attacks in the recent weeks, mm -hmm. the ransom, uh, ransomware. Uh, and you see this has been uh, the, the indications that this could be as a result of uh, use of uh, 
vulnerabilities that were detected by CIA and the National Security Agency and then shared and they may have been exploited by a rogue state like North, North Korea. And uh, North Korea is simply tinkering the world and especially uh, East China Sea Thank you. as well as the peninsula into war. Thank and you. we need to watch that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Apollos, very briefly. I think the world community should now realize that they are not respecting international law. And if they do, they, I think we should now come around and revisit these laws because they appear to be, you know, to be useless in light of uh, international security. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Judge Musamale. Uh, I think what is happening in North Korea should also uh, put us on guard. And I'm seeing a situation whereby the whole world is going to be dragged into the Northern Korea issue. And probably we are looking at a situation whereby we're heading to the Third World War. Uh, I think action needs to be taken now, and North Korea needs to be dealt with seriously. Thank you. I think um, we, we need to, to, to be alive to the fact that the world is changing. Uh, Donald Trump has come with new dynamics in world international politics and the world security dynamics. And therefore, as a country, I think even as we align ourselves with the people who are giving us grants and aids, we must understand that uh, at one point, we must align ourselves to what is the winning team in the world. And therefore, that winning team should be the one that we should be putting a lot of effort to align ourselves because international politics is changing. Thank you. Yeah. Right, uh, Professor Naomi Damba, the Vice Chancellor of KCA University and also an expert on foreign uh, policy and defense. Thank you for coming through this morning. Also, Captain Wanderi, Collins Wanderi, who is an advocate of the High Court and security analyst here on NTV. Thank you for coming through. Criminologist from Edgerton University, Dr. Apollos Mashira. Thank you for coming through this morning and your insight as well. George Musamali, security analyst. Thank you for coming through. And Captain Simiu, Wirunga Simiu, thank you for coming through this morning, our security analysts.